Let's talk about DevOps, or to be more specific, what really matters for DevOps practitioners, or what should matter. My name is Victor. I work for Upbound. We're a company behind Crossplane. You might want to check it out. I will not be talking about Crossplane in this talk, but I have another one in this conference, and you might want to check it out because there will be a live demo with Crossplane and a few other tools. So check it out, but not right now. So what is DevOps. When I ask people that question, the answer is usually something along the lines, hey, it's about containers, it's about Kubernetes, it's about cloud, GitOps, CICD, logging, monitoring, infrastructures, code, troubleshooting, security, service mesh, and so on and so forth. But those are only the tools, and very often the tools that only selected number of people understand. Those are not the tools that are used by everybody because if you find me a person who understands all those things, you know, Kubernetes containers, cloud, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I will be very, very grateful because I never met a person who understands and has real practical experience in all of those tools. Those tools are used by different uh, professionals and we need to combine them together and then I'll get to what happens then in a second. The important part right now is to ask a question. Should developers, should everybody use all those tools? And the answer is no, because they cannot. I mean, that's just overwhelming. That's too much. Nobody would be doing anything except learning Kubernetes and service mesh and what's on it. Now, let me backtrack for a second with a question. What is DevOps? According to my definition, it is about combining development and operations with the goal, and this is important, to enable developers or everybody else to be self-sufficient. It is about shifting left, because one thing we cannot do is say, hey, now you do it. Now you spend three years learning Kubernetes, half a year learning service mesh, and three months to figure out logging and monitoring and so on and so forth. No, we cannot say, now you do it yet. We cannot continue with the old uh, idea that uh, everybody opens Jira tickets whenever they need something and then they wait until that something happens and nobody understands what's going on and so on and so forth. We want to shift left. We want to enable developers to be self-sufficient, to be able to do whatever they need to do, whether that's creating a cluster, whether that is creating and managing a database, whether that is defining and deploying applications. It does not matter what that is, but what does matter is that we want to enable developers to be able to perform operations themselves. And to do that, we need to simplify things greatly. So from my perspective, DevOps is all about creating services that others can consume and others can be developers, testers, or any other person working uh, with us in a company. And when we create all those services, what do we get? If we are successful, to be more precise, what do we get? We get internal developer platform or IDP. That's the main focus that all the people on the right side, DevOps, SRE, security, and so on and so forth, should be working on. And if we do that, if we are successful in enabling developers to be self-sufficient by giving them services put together in a platform, then we will be very successful for a simple reason, because that frees operations. And when I say operations, I mean all the people on the right side of a uh, life cycle of an application or a system. But that will free operations to do what matters. And what matters is writing code that ends up being a service, that ends up being part of a platform that others can use, instead of waiting for Jira tickets or emails or Slack messages saying, hey, I need an application, or hey, I need this deployed, or where is my cluster, and so on and so forth. And there is a lot of data that backs that idea, that proves that teams that are self-sufficient and that are self-sufficient by consuming services are having a lot of benefits. We see increase in productivity, reduction in lean time, increase in development frequency, decrease mean time to repair or MTTR, decrease in change failure rate and so on and so forth. And it all boils down on enabling everybody to 
fully manage the life cycle of whatever they're working on. And that typically means four high level distinct types of operations or phases. We need to be able to change the desired state of something that we want to manage. We need to be able to perform some actions. We need to be able to converge the actual into the desired state. And finally, we should be able to observe the state, the actual state of our systems or applications or clusters or what's or not. So if we would be building an internal developer platform today from scratch, how would we do that? We would need to combine at least five different areas. We need to be able to manage the actual state, which can be different providers like AWS or Azure or Google, maybe on-prem, maybe Datadog, Splunk, Elastic, and so on and so forth. There are many providers and everybody today is multi-cloud. If you use, let's say, AWS and GitHub, well, those are two cloud services, you're multi-cloud. Within those providers, we need to be able to manage servers and clusters and databases. And inside of that infrastructure, we have our applications or third-party applications if we are self-managing them. And all that together is the actual state. That's what should exist. Now, the question is, how do we get to have that actual state? And the answer today is in the desired state, which we manage through GitOps. That's Git. We store all code. And when I say code, I mean something that can be interpreted by machines. And by that definition, YAML is code, HCL is code, Java is code. Everything that can be interpreted by machines is code. And where do we store code? In Git. And that code stored in Git is the desired state. It is an expression of our desires of what we want to have. And then that somehow automatically needs to become the actual state. Now, today, if you're building something like that from scratch, the engine that is ensuring that the desired state and the actual state is in sync is Kubernetes. There are many reasons why I'm saying Kubernetes, but two of them are extremely important. First of all, Kubernetes has a built-in mechanism to monitor the state of something through its control loops and to converge the desired state, which in case of Kubernetes is defined as custom resources or resources into the actual state. Now that actual state can be pods running in Kubernetes or it can be AWS resources, or it can be anything else. Kubernetes is not meant to be an engine that runs our containers. It is much more than that. Now, the second reason why Kubernetes is extremely important is its ability to extend itself, to extend its API through custom resource definitions. And that's crucial because of the things that I said at the very beginning. If we want to enable everybody to be self-sufficient, we cannot say, hey, uh, define a deployment or a service and a stateful set and ingress and virtual service and so on and so forth, and you have an application. That's too complex. But what we can do is create a custom resource definition that says, hey, this, exactly this, is how a backend application should be defined. I don't know, 10 lines of YAML or something like that. This is how our application should be defined with the things that matter. And without the complexity that that involves, this is what it means to have a cluster in our organization and so on and so forth. We can do that by creating custom resource definitions with control loops and everything else that comes with it. And in that way, expose the things that matter to everybody and hide the complexity through controllers that will perform certain tasks and essentially act as operators, machine operators. So Kubernetes with custom resource definitions and custom resources and control loops and controllers and so on and so forth, among other things, can monitor the state of Git and then converge the state into the actual state, which can be anything. And the manifests in Git are the custom resources instead of the building blocks that are currently offered by vendors or whatever we are using. On top of that, we need a user interface that serves two purposes. First, help people define uh, the things that they need. Hey, you need a cluster, 
this is what you should do. Hey, you need an application, backend application or frontend application. This is how you should define it. And that interface can be anything. It can be a web UI, it can be a CLI, it can be an IDE and so on and so forth. However, for such an interface to truly work, it needs to have a unique single API it can talk to instead of going through 57 different APIs that are presented by 57 different vendors and tools and so on and so forth. And that's again where Kubernetes comes in because we can extend its API and present to everybody a single API to manage to define everything. And such an interface would ultimately be writing things to get pushing unless you choose to do that directly, but also interacting with the actual state but in read-only mode, right? We do not SSH into servers anymore. We do not interact directly with whatever we are using with our servers or networking and so on and so forth. We do that through Git, but we still need access to the actual state to observe what's going on. And finally, for Kubernetes controllers to do whatever they need to do, they need to interact with different tools, and those tools can be pipelines or GitOps or infrastructure or RBAC and so on and so forth. That's the job of controllers to use tools or do things directly and figure out what to do, when to use it, and so on and so forth. But for the end users, many of those tools are irrelevant because, again, they are going through a single UI, and that single UI is interacting with a single API, and that single API is based on Kubernetes with its resources that are making sure that all the other tools are involved and doing what they need to do, or maybe controllers themselves could be doing things directly. The whole point, and the very important thing that I'm trying to make is, among other things, is that everything must be tailor-made to match developer needs, and not only any developer needs, that's why Heroku failed, but developer needs in our specific organization. And to do that, to get to that point, we need to figure out whether we should buy something or build something ourselves. If we buy something, then that something will be opinionated by a vendor. So you can choose, let's say, Heroku, but then you need to adapt everything you have to, in this case, Heroku, but same applies to any other vendor opinionated solution, or you can build it yourself. And most of the bigger companies must build their own internal developer platforms. And the reason is simple. Any medium to big site company already has processes, assets, and so on and so forth, and they cannot adapt easily to something that is vendor opinionated, but they need, everybody, we need to build it ourselves. And if we do build it ourselves, the question is, should you do it from scratch, like, you know, open main.go and start typing code that will become one day your platform? And the answer is clearly no. When I say build, I do not mean build from scratch, but assemble it using the tools that we have. So the tools, ideal tools today is backstage for the front end, cross plane to act as a control plane with compositions that enable you to easily create custom resource definitions with controllers and define what something is, Argo CD or Flux for synchronization, for GitOps, pipelines, use any. That's about it. Th those are the key ingredients if we would be building an internal developer platform today. Thank you so much for watching and remember to come to my other talk that will be hands-on and then you can see some of those things in action. Thank you so much. I'm not sure whether I have enough time to answer questions or no, but uh, if I can, I will. So bring them on.